Okay, and Rabbi Levy is here with us, and a few others have joined us, and I am thrilled to, uh, to end off in Hawaii, and I'll tell you why. I, there's a beautiful story, and uh, I appreciate Rabbi Levy, you're with us, and we're going to start momentarily, and, uh, and uh, we, I see you are here, but uh, I guess you'll, you'll join us in a moment. The, uh, the, the, there's a story that I heard a few years back uh, firsthand, and I thought it was a fantastic story, and I want to share it with you, and it really ties into our ending off this series of 22 Zoomings Around the World. Uh, in Hawaii. Wow. And the story goes like this. There was a, a, a man who right. lost his, lost a, he lost a parent, lost his father. The story was uh, a few years ago. And he wasn't particularly observant, religious. But one thing he always ensured to do was that on the yard site, on the day of the passing uh, of, the, of his father, he would make sure to be in shul and say Kaddish. Uh, the traditional Kaddish prayer, which one says on the uh, on the death of of a of a, of a, of, a, of, a cl- of a relative. One year he, he was on business travels. The time flew. He landed at night, and he struck him that he had not said Kaddish that day. And that day he was his father's website, and he was broken. He was broken. I'm going to put everyone on mute just to keep it crystal clear. But uh, we will have time afterwards for questions and answers. And of course, if anybody wants to. Leave off with anything I'd love to hear from you tonight. We, uh, so we'll leave that for the end. So he was, he was crushed. He had never missed a Kaddish prayer. And it's a, it was a big deal for this person. So he calls his Chabad rabbi in New York, uh, a man named Rabbi Butman. And I heard this from Rabbi Butman himself, uh, that uh, what should I do? I missed Kaddish. You know, he, couldn't, he, couldn't, he couldn't stand him. So he, couldn't, he couldn't sit still. He, you know, it, was, it really, really uh, bothered him. So I have a bookman told him, one second, you know, it's already nighttime here in New York, but in California, they're three hours back. So it's still the daytime there. Perhaps we'll catch a Kaddish in California. So he gets onto the phone with a Chabad Shaliach in California, like we did in Hollywood. He had a friend in Los Angeles. So he gets on and uh, he says, have you, David, have you done the Mincha prayer, which is the, the, the last daily prayer for the daytime? Uh, my revarvit is already at nighttime. And the man said, yeah, I already did that. Oh, we missed California. So the man is, is you know, it's crushed again. He's like, well, we missed it. So I go and says, no, 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 no. There's still hope. Hawaii. Get the Chabad rabbi in Hawaii. We could do Kaddish for you because for your, for your father. In Hawaii, it's still the previous day. They're six hours behind us. So he gets on the phone with the Chabad rabbi in Hawaii, not with Rabbi Levi, who's with us tonight. Rabbi Levi was not there yet. Uh, this is a few years back before Rabbi Levi came to the Rabbi Krasniansky, many of us know from TMR, Rabbi Moshe Krasniansky, his brother is the chief Chabad rabbi of Hawaii. And he gets on the phone and the secretary of the shul answers the phone and says, uh, you know, well, can I help you? Chabad of Hawaii, how can I help you? And Rabbi Bookman says, I need to speak to Rabbi Krasniansky ASAP. And she says, sorry, he just went into the synagogue to pray. Can he call you back? He says, stop him. Don't let him pray. Hold him up. So the, she ran to get Rabbi, and just before they finished the prayers, uh, Rabbi Krasniansky did a three-way phone call with this man, and he heard a Kaddish being said for his father on the day of the yard site, on the day of the passing, because it was still that day in Hawaii. Uh, I, I, in, according to my world, uh, is that the, I think, I, in my world, I think Hawaii is the earliest time. Am I completely off? Is, is there a time that goes before Hawaii even? I don't know. Anyways, but Hawaii to me, you know, the, the, the moral of this story is that the world, the sun never sets on a Jew. The sun never sets. There's always the sun is, is, is somewhere out there, right? Even for a person, even in our lives, when the sun sets, it's rising somewhere else, right? The sun is always around. There's always hope. There's always light. There's always the warmth that the sun provides for us. And we could connect to it, especially now that you have been with us. So many of you, of you have been with us for all 22 of our travels. You know that there's, the sun is, is rising everywhere around the world. You have friends uh, around the world. And, and as I mentioned in the email I sent out on Thursday, that uh, as, as COVID is coming down, thank God, and we are, the world is getting more and more free and open, I'm sure all of us are planning trips. You know that you have 22 places that have invited you to come. And, uh, and you'll have a full-on, wonderful Jewish experience wherever you go around the world. And please do reach out to me if you do plan on visiting any of those places, and I will connect you 
with your friends that you've met on these Zooms. So without further ado, I want to introduce my good friend and classmate, Rabbi Levi Gerlitsky is here with us. Levi, I'm going to unmute you. I'm just going to introduce you uh, for a brief moment, and I'll let you do the rest of the introduction. Uh, Rabbi Levi and I actually were together in yeshiva, although Rabbi Levi is a, is a few years older than I am. I'm actually uh, classmates more with his younger brother, Avrami. But Levi and I were also in yeshiva, although in different grades together. Uh, I still remember Levi sitting in the corner there in 770 in the Chabad headquarters, uh, learning with his study partner. And uh, they were like our role models, like real studious guys. And uh, Rabbi Levi then, uh, as he will tell us himself, uh, got married and moved out to the big island of Hawaii, and we actually moved almost the same time when I moved to Montreal, back to Montreal with my wife and our two-month-year-old daughter, Mushka. Uh, Rabbi Levy was moving around the same time, so we actually went to pick up boxes together. It was a certain uh, company that gave out boxes uh, for young Chabad uh, couples that were moving around the world. They had kind of like a, a contract with the Chabad headquarters to give free boxes to uh, those packing boxes to go around the world. So I was packing up from Brooklyn to Montreal. He was packing up from Brooklyn to Hawaii and we were picking up the boxes at the same time. So that, that was the last time I think we saw each other. And then uh, Rabbi Levy now is with us all the way from the, the big island of Hawaii. Welcome back, Levy. Welcome back to Montreal. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for coming and uh, being our, fi our, our, fi our grand finale, our final edition here on the Zooming Around the World series. So Levy, tell us a little bit about yourself. I understand that you have some Montreal connections. Yeah, but just as a preface, I'm on the road. I just want to make sure the background noise, is that okay? Do you hear too much background noise? I could go outside or is this fine? Do you hear me clear? It's okay? I, I hear you clearly. I think I, hear, okay, I see perfect. some uh, thumbs up. I think we hear you clearly for now. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so I actually was born in Montreal. I'm a proud Canadian. I was a Canadian before I was American. My grandfather, I have to give a lot of credit to the government of Canada, got a visa during Second World War. He grew up in Poland. Two of his siblings left to Israel prior to the war. They survived, thank God. But the rest of his family that stayed behind, including his fiance, because he was engaged at the time, all died during the Holocaust. They were all killed. He managed to escape. He ended up first in Japan. Then they got to Shanghai, China. From there, they were stuck for a little while. Many people were stuck till after the war. Luckily for him and a few friends, Canada gave out visas to a limited amount of students. So nine Chabad students got visas to come to Canada and the previous Chabad Rebbe sent them specifically to Montreal from all communities. And they started the Chabad community in Montreal. So my grandfather was there already from the early 1940s. My father was born there. I was born there. But most of my life, I grew up in New York, in uh, Brooklyn. So that's a little bit of my Canadian connection. I was born in Jewish General Hospital. I uh, actually have some relatives still there. Maybe some of you are familiar with Pizza Pita. There's a kosher pizza store on the carry. So that's my uncle of mine, my father's sister's husband and a brother of his that owns it. So yeah, Montreal is a very special place in our heart. Fantastic. Wow, I didn't know the Pizza Pita connection. We were just there. <laughs> so I would have known. I, maybe I would have gotten a discount. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now I know. All right. But yes, I actually, Levi, I remember your grandfather very well, Rabbi Moshe el Yogerlitsky, a small, short man, but what a, uh, a powerful figure. And perhaps some of us uh, remember him um, and a very special man, one of the leaders of the Chabad community here in Montreal. And uh, oh, Levi, we lost you there for a moment. But uh, one of the things I remember him is he used to make announcements in shul. He used to get up and he had, you know, you know he was not, a, no, no embarrassed. He wasn't embarrassed. He wasn't, he, he, when he had to say something, he would get up there and say it. And that was always to me, like a role model. And when you got to do something, something's got to be said, just get up there and do it. Uh, don't, not to be, uh, not, you know, not to be worried about what people are thinking perhaps. Uh, but that much more. If, uh, there's a recently a book came out about the beginnings of the Chabad community here in Montreal with what's called the nine students 
uh, Rabbi Kramer, Rabbi Kramer, uh, perhaps more famous of the nine, uh, amongst others, um, who ran the yeshiva. But uh, Levi's grandfather was definitely one of those that started the uh, Chabad community here in Montreal, which today is uh, one of the largest Chabad communities around the world. So that's incredible. And uh, the fact that you're Canadian, Levi, is, uh, <laughs> makes us proud. Uh, we need some pride right now to be Canadian. So we're happy that you're... Uh... <laughs> Yeah. All right. So touching a raw spot there. Okay. So Levy, now that we know you grew up in Brooklyn, uh, tell us a little bit about your family and then uh, tell, get, take us through your, you know, your yeshiva years where you've been and, and, and uh, your family a little bit. And then how did you end up from Montreal to Brooklyn to Hawaii of all places? So my father got married in 1981. We had family that they started in New York. I'm one of 14 siblings. So I have six old, I'm number six, five older siblings, eight younger siblings. Thank God, really happy with uh, that size family. It was something that Chabad Rebbe highly encouraged his followers to have many children. It's based on halachic texts, but this was something specifically that he encouraged. So grew up in New York, Went to yeshiva, of course, my younger years in New York, the typical Chabad yeshiva, Ali Torah. After, when I was 15 years old, the age when usually people want to go away in order to delve more into their studies, I went to France. There's a yeshiva, Berwa, in France. I was there for three years. It was really nice. It's a great yeshiva experience. You're a little bit outside of the city in an isolated place all by yourselves. After that, I came back to New York to finish off the studies. They sent me away afterwards to volunteer for a year or two. You go to other yeshivas and you become like a mentor for younger students. So I went to California. I learned there for two years. And then I came back to New York to finish off my rabbinical studies. After we got married, um, I was doing my rabbinical studies. We finished the main part. I got married at that time. And then we were looking to do some type of shlichut. We definitely were motivated to do something where we're giving up our career for the sake of the Jewish community. We said, why do something which not necessarily we find important or enjoy, let's say not to offend anyone that does a specific career, but let's use accounting, for example. I wouldn't enjoy doing accounting, but I would just be doing it in order to support the family, I figured, let me do something that I actually believe in. The time I'm spending to support my family will also be something meaningful, something that I believe is the call of the hour. So my wife and I, we agreed to go out to some Chabad community. We were open to anywhere. We actually tried out, there was a position in Nigeria, Chabad of Nigeria. There's a Rabbi Uzan there, French rabbi. He's there full-time in Abuja, which is the capital, but we have Lagos, which is the main city, the populated city. That's the original area where most of the people live. You made There's a good a, choice. You made a good choice. <laughs> yeah. So we went there. Actually, we tried it out. And my wife said, uh, never again. <laughs> After a few weeks of living there, it's a third world country. It's not very safe. You have to live in like a compound security the whole time. Right before we came, there was actually an Israeli that got killed by some mafia group. I'm not sure exactly the details what happened there, but it's a country that has a lot of natural resources. However, it's not very safe. People don't come there to tour and vacation. People come exclusively for business or if they're locals. So that Chabad Rabbi lives there full year. Well, we lost Levy for a moment. Levy, get your Wi-Fi got stuck. But uh, just to remember, we were actually in Lagos uh, all the way back at the beginning, one of our first trips uh, to our friend there. Levi, are you back with us? Maybe he got frozen. See that he's frozen back in time. He doesn't know yet what it means to be 8, 19 p.m. on a Sunday, July 4th. And he's in America. Can you imagine that? A little bit backwards over there. All right. Let's remember in Hawaii, they are six hours behind us and Levy is still frozen. Oh, okay. Hopefully he'll come back. There he is. All right. Levy, I'm going to unmute you in just a moment. Uh, there you go. Right, right. Yeah, I'm back on. You're back Sorry. with us. All right. Okay. So 
eventually we were open for other opportunities. And then there was a Chabad rabbi in the big island. And he decided that he wasn't working out. He was going to leave. And they were looking for someone that would start it. So at that point, we came, we tried it out five years ago. We had then, and we really liked it. Like we could go into later the advantages that you have in Hawaii. Some people, uh, of course, wouldn't understand why we would end up in Hawaii. But it was really nice. And we moved out here permanently four years ago. Right now we have four children and thank God it's uh, a great success. Kenai Nahada, beautiful. And uh, your, your wife is from where, Levy? My wife is from California. Her father moved out to Palo Alto, California, the Bay Area, just south of San Francisco, also to Star Chabad. My wife is actually one of 13 children. So we both come from large families. So just uh, we made the interesting statistics um, after all the siblings get married, because of course we both have younger siblings not married. So because I have 13 siblings, she has 12, that would be 25 siblings after they all get married. That would be 50 uncles and aunts for our <laughs> children. And that's without the cousins. So there'll be a lot of relatives. Kenai <laughs> incredible. So Levi, uh, tell us a little bit about, before we get into your role there in the Jewish community, in, in, uh, in Hawaii. Tell us a little bit about the history of the Jewish community in Hawaii in general. Is there anything you can share with us? I'm just gonna point out, Levi, that you're, you are breaking up a little bit. Um, so we're missing some things, but in general, we hear you. But if anybody in the, that's watching, if anybody is having trouble, or if you could just put in the chat, let me know so that I, I can uh, try to work out better with Levi and uh, Levi can try to be in a better spot perhaps. But maybe let's let's continue on until that comes up again. Yeah. So the Jewish community in Hawaii, there's a little bit of speculation of how far back they go. There are some that say that the early Hawaiian culture, the kings actually had Jewish advisors. Um, there was someone that told me, I haven't seen this myself, but they said there was a coin minted in Hawaii before it became part of the United States that had a Star of David on it. There's many concepts in Hawaii that are similar to Judaism. One of the famous ones, which is very rare, is the concept of Ari Miklat. Ari Miklat is one of the commandments in the Torah that if someone by mistake kills someone, they had to do some type of repentance, some type of self-reflection in an isolated city away from the regular life, because even if a mistake can happen to you, shows that there was some thing that needs to be rectified. Similar to the idea of the Freudian slip, that if someone can say something or think a certain way, it must be that they have some connection to it. So just like that law, they have in Hawaii a similar law where if someone commits certain cardinal sins, cardinal offenses, that they have to be punished by death, they were told to go to a city, a sanctuary city, where they had to live there in order to save their life. So that's interesting that they had such an idea, uh, a copy of the Torah laws. And there's other areas where they found similarities, like the word aloha, which is very famous, is very similar to the word shalom. Shalom in Hebrew has many meanings to it. People will use it to say hi, goodbye, peace, we're good friends, is everything okay? And it's similar to the word aloha, which is not just hello, but it's used in Hawaii as a form of love, friendship, Ohana, which is a very famous Hawaiian idea of family. They definitely place a large emphasis on family, community, having that relationship of not just each one worrying for themselves, where some people can get off that impression that it's the battle of the fittest, try to outdo everyone in business in order for you to be successful. Hawaiian culture is not so much driven in that direction of money, earning, and self-worth, but rather in helping the land, helping other people, really caring for the community. So there's definitely speculation that some of these ideas might have come from Jews that went far away because there's a lot of prophecies in the Torah that mention about being exiled to the faraway islands. Now, from the furthest islands that you could get from Israel, Hawaii is just about 12 to 13 hour time zone different than Israel because we don't change our clocks during the summer. We have the same clock year round, but the time zone is about just the opposite of Israel, on the other side of the world. 
which is interesting, everyone in the United States, Canada included, prays towards the east. When you want to pray to Jerusalem, in Hawaii, we start praying west. We're from the first country or the first state that actually starts praying west in order to get to Jerusalem, because we're that far away, just on the other side of the world, where you start praying the opposite direction. Uh, I tell visitors that come here, a lot of them don't know. They make that mistake of praying east. I say, don't worry, your prayers will get to Jerusalem. It just takes a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we pray west because it's that far away. So very possible that if a Jew is being exiled from Israel and looking to go far away, looking to start himself a new life and going to places where no one's been there yet, Hawaii might be a great opportunity to stop in. I actually, getting back to my grandfather coming to Canada, he actually also on his way from China to Canada stopped off in Hawaii. So he already laid that groundwork of having the initial roots laid in Hawaii before we came. And I would say also Hawaii is a very welcoming, caring community, especially they have good ties with the land of Israel. Like we had the acting attorney, the acting, um, I forgot already his title, but one of the high officials of the Israeli government, which was in LA in charge of that region, came to Hawaii. They welcomed him really nicely. We had him speak to the community. And yeah, I would say overall, it's a really Jewish friendly area. We're, we're just losing at the end of that, Levy, but it's incredible to hear about the roots and the, the similarities that Hawaii has in so many different ways uh, to, the, to the Jewish people and to our, uh, to our Torah. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing to, to see and that you find that in your in your day-to-day -day life over there. So let's, let's understand now, going further, um, you come to Hawaii four years ago. What was the situation of the Jewish community? Was there a Jewish community? How was it? Uh, and and uh, what did you come to add, or did you go to a different place other than where there was the, the Jewish community from beforehand? So the island is called the Big Island because it's the largest geographically. It's not the main island. It's not the most populated one. Uh, most populated is Oahu. That has the city of Honolulu. But this island, to give perspective, it's over 4,000 square miles. Uh, the largest island in the U.S., from all the islands like Long Island in New York, which is pretty populated, is about a third of the size of our island. But population wise, we have under 200,000 people on the whole island. So if anybody's worried that there's not enough room for humans to live on the planet, they're all welcome to come here. We can fit millions more on our island. So there's definitely, it's really spread out. And I would say also, our work is for people that come here, it's People that are really nice, easygoing, and relaxed, but not specifically very Judaism oriented. Judaism is not on the top of their list that when they pick a community, they say, is there a synagogue? Is there a school? Is there a kosher restaurant? Is there a supermarket, kosher meat? They're coming to the island because of what the island is. It's far away, isolated, spread out. You can really live in peace and tranquility. You don't have the worries of weather like you'll have in Montreal. So. People are very friendly, but it's not like they say, let's move together and we'll build a community. We need a synagogue, we need a rabbi, we need to have a whole infrastructure of Judaism. They're more, when it's uh, interesting and they're around and they're available, sure, they'll stop by and they'll always have time if you come to them. People are not in a rush over here. We call it island time, which is something real, that uh, everything works really slow, easygoing. People, it's very normal to come late to appointments. I guess I'm a little bit getting that rubbed off on me. I apologize. Uh, that's very common because people are really taking it very easy, which took me time in the beginning when I came here. I found that a little irritating. If anybody has been in New York, you grow up with this mentality that everything has to be rushed and quick and get moving and the line has to move really smoothly and in traffic, no one could take any time. You really have to hit the gas as soon as it turns green. And coming to Hawaii was really difficult in learning really how to slow down, how to take it easy and start planning ahead where you cannot expect to come to the store and leave in a second. People will talk and people will take their time. But it's an advantage in the community as well, that because people are so nice, therefore we appreciate that. When I was looking to go out for a Chabad community, I wanted somewhere 
where people in a way were interested enough that you have to feel that you're nudging them and arguing with them or really trying to convince them to come to your synagogue and not another synagogue. I said, let me find a place where people are happy to have some type of Jewish experience and we're available to offer it. So therefore Hawaii really quick, clicked well with us. Incredible. And to hear that contrast, you know, growing up in Brooklyn and then having to come to uh, live with such a different uh, life. That's amazing. Um, let, let's let's uh, go out to the other areas you mentioned. You are in a, in a separate island. You're not on the island where Honolulu is. There is a Chabad community there and perhaps other uh, Jewish communities there as well. What is the Jewish life like in Hawaii before you came? I guess even I guess there was nothing there in the Big Island where you are now, but just in general in that in in, in Hawaii in general. So there was always a Jewish presence, like on our island as well. There were Jews that would get together. There was no uh, permanent rabbi, but Jews would get together and make services on their own once in a while at uh, different holidays. So there was always some involvement with Judaism. I had an uncle of mine which currently is the Chabad in Tel Aviv, Israel. He's been there for many years now, over 40 years. When he was a buffer, before he was married, a single guy, he came out to all the islands in Hawaii and they made events on our island as well, where they just put advertisements in the newspaper, visiting rabbis and Jews would come. So there always was Jewish people here. They always got together. There was a Jewish cemetery here for a little while. But of course, there's always can be used more services, more opportunities. And I like the aspect that there's always a variety of Jewish life available, just like when it comes to stores, we don't like a monopoly that there's, you know, one Walmart and everybody has to shop there. We like a variety of different people, like different atmospheres, different vibes, different rabbis, different jokes, different food. So too with communities, it's nice when there's a variety of Jewish possibilities available where people can decide, you know, today I'm interested in a little bit of a different style. So it's not a, a one version, a one way. Everybody celebrating their Judaism, the way it fits for them, as long as it's done in a traditional way, is really nice. And that's something that Hawaii has definitely a variety of options of how people will celebrate and how people will get involved. Some people privately will make events at their home. And yeah, it's really nice in that aspect. So I won't say there wasn't anything before we came, but we bring what Chabad brings, we bring a traditional, loyal Judaism, uh, or as the joke says, I don't like using so much of these labels, but I'll just say it for uh, what it is. They say Chabad is uh, Orthodox Judaism, um, sorry, it's conservative Judaism run by Orthodox people for Reformed Jews. So it's supposed to be offering something for everyone where everybody should feel welcome. We constantly get calls, I'm sure if you guys are familiar with Chabad, in uh, Montreal, people are worried if I don't keep kosher or if I don't keep Shabbat, can I come? And we say, we're keeping Judaism in the traditional way, but whatever you do elsewhere is not important. Uh, whereas we say, when people come to our synagogue, I say, I don't know how people get to our front door, but no one drives through our front door on Shabbat. Everybody <laughs> walks through our front door. So that's... Um, yeah. Those are incredible lines, Leif. I'm going to use those. Those are great. I never heard them before. Look at that. Okay, so so tell us a little bit more about specifically. You're bringing the Chabad spirit, of course, to uh, to a, a wonderful place. It sounds like this is an amazing uh, place, and I mean the fact that you're sitting in Starbucks also is, is incredible. <laughs> uh, it's very relaxing just to watch you sit in Starbucks. It's very relaxing. Uh, but tell us a little bit more about the the practical, let's say, uh, kosher food. Do you go picking off? Uh, do you go picking the? Uh, the uh, fruits off the trees. Like, how do you, how does that work in the Big Island? Keeping kosher, yeah. um, synagogue wise. Do you have a synagogue? Let's get more of a picture of your day to day life, uh, living according to Torah. Yeah, so that's definitely where the challenges come about. It's nice to live here, and the people that come here on vacation think it's amazing. They say, "Oh, I wish I could live here. If only I didn't have to live in the big city." But when you get here for a long period of time, that's where it gets difficult. So there's no Jewish schools available. So your kids got to be homeschooled. There's no kosher supermarkets, no kosher restaurants on our island. Uh, all our meat, all our dairy products, because we do Chalav Yisrael, like the higher standard of kosher dairy products, we ship it all in by boat, frozen container. 
So those containers that they do for shipping, they have special ones with freezers uh, because a lot of things that get shipped into Hawaii have to come frozen, even the non-kosher products. But the kosher, we have to arrange our own shipment. So it's expensive. In general, everything in Hawaii is expensive because everything has to be shipped in, especially the kosher food. So electricity even has to be, all the products that they need for the electricity has to be shipped in, so it's expensive. They call it the paradise tax, the tax that you pay for living in paradise. So it's definitely more difficult, like a synagogue, we, there's no permanent synagogue on our island for any group of Jews, which is sad. We're hoping one day that we will be able to build one, but for now we made a makeshift synagogue. We have a tent in our backyard. We use that as a synagogue. It's really nice. It has the great advantage that year round, it's basically the same weather. So we never have to worry about any snowfalls or blizzards or anything that will disrupt our service. As long as you're covered from the sun and the rain, otherwise you're basically the same weather year round. Um, anywhere from the low 90s to sometimes the mid 70s. That's just about the range that we have. So it's hard kosher wise. Things have to be planned in advance. Because of that, we also offer local people to ship in kosher food together with us. Once we're making an order, we let out a notice to the community. Our new order is coming in at this time. Feel free if you want to add anything. To some people, we'll make a kosher order when it's available. Other challenges, of course, are mikvah. Mikvah is a difficult one. It's actually an interesting story I'll share. Mikvah, of course, is for the Jewish woman. She has to go roughly once a month in order to cleanse herself. It's a biblical commandment, a really important one. It says it actually helps with the child's soul to be revealed and happy, proud to be Jewish. So it's something that we don't have here on the island. It's expensive, it needs to be built. It needs a, a lot of uh, resources in order to get to it. We have the Pacific Ocean, which is the large, from I guess the largest mikvah in the world, which is used at some point. Um, it could be used, but it's not convenient because we don't have, you don't have a shower, you don't have privacy, there's people around, there's sand on the floor, there's waves, there's rocks, there's fish, it's dark at night. So sometimes people go there, but some people are uncomfortable. So the closest other mikvahs on another island, we had, had actually here a woman really committed to doing mikvah, and she had to go to another island in order to do the mikvah. She was too scared of doing the ocean. Her flight back, because of delays with the mikvah, she missed her flight back, and it was going to start, the, that night was starting Sukkot, and it would go two days Sukkot, and then after that followed by Shabbat. So it was going to be a three-day uh, missing if because she missed her flight she wouldn't be home and she had still a young baby at home so she had to make her flight back she took one nursing baby with her but the second baby that still needed her was still at home but she was really committed for mikvah she made it and then she was stuck with getting a flight back home in time for the chag time for the holiday so last minute her husband was able to arrange they did a private chartered uh, flight which was expensive cost them over two thousand dollars just to fly last minute because the, she had to be home for, for the Chag. And turns out her husband had to go to the airport in order to pick her up just to make it like literally by the last few minutes. And he figured if I, he goes, he'll be able to zip through traffic and make it quickly home. The flight got slightly delayed till they came out. It was too late. So the husband walked home a three hour walk on the first night, but thank God they made it. And I was super impressed on how committed they were where not just that they say, I want to do this mitzvah, mikvah, which is so difficult, I'm going to fly to another island, I'll pay for the travel in order to do it. But sometimes when we do the right thing, we expect God to split seas before us. We say, God, I'm doing what you want. Of course, I'm going to have miracles, I'm going to have success, and everybody's going to applaud me, and I'll get paparazzi in the newspapers, and I'll be on the front pages, and I'll be the world's hero because of the great things I'm doing. But as God's way of sometimes... Uh, I don't know if you want to call it comedy or if it's his way of building us even stronger, specifically when we're going out of our way to do the right thing, he sometimes makes it even more difficult and more challenging. And that's really where the test is. If someone's going to say, you know, I was only doing it because I thought I'm going to get this big reward. And now that you're not giving me that reward, uh, I'm out. Or if someone says, I'm doing this because it's the right thing and no challenge, no struggle, no hardship is going to get in my way. I'm going to push forward and do it 
even when it's difficult. And despite, the more difficult it is, this is actually a beautiful thing that I tell myself, the more difficult something is, means just how important it is. If it wasn't important, why would the Yetzir Hara, the forces of evil, work so hard on stopping us from doing it? He would say, ah, what do I care? Do it, don't do it, doesn't make a difference. But because it's important, therefore he gives us challenges and he makes us feel like, you know, this is such a stressful thing, just give up. But that just tells us how much it's really significant. So that's definitely getting back to the challenges of living on the island. You have those um, difficulties with living in an isolated place. Incredible. What an incredible story. And that's, that's really, we love to hear stories about the ripple effect of mitzvahs. And that's like one mitzvah to the next, from the mikvah to <laughs> keeping the chag properly, to, you know, walk, you know, missing a, almost missing a flight to walking those three hours, the dedication and, 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 the, and the pride of doing the right thing. That's an incredible story. And it's definitely inspiring for all of us here in Montreal. Uh, Levi, let's, let's wrap things up over here. We are running out of time, but then well, I'll definitely open up if there's any questions, as usually, uh, as usual, uh, if anyone wants to put them on the chat. I see already there's a few questions here. I'll moderate those. And then if anybody wants to speak to Levy on the mic, we'll, un- we'll give the ability to unmute and you can speak to our representative in the Big Island uh, who doesn't yet know what the evening of, mon- of Sunday night looks like. So we could tell him. Uh, so there's six hours behind us there. Levy, tell us a little bit about uh, you're, you're in Starbucks, I see, and you look, you, you look kind of Jewish. Uh, how does it feel walking around the big island? Uh, there's a lot of worries, especially now with anti-Semitism, uh, even, especially in America. We've been all over the world, and we've heard only good reports. And it comes to America, it, gets, uh, it sounds a little more scary. How does it feel there, specifically in your location, uh, walking around? Uh, do you feel free and confident? Do you have to worry? Is there security? What's, what's the situation there? Yeah. So actually, thank God, I would say the Big Island is a very safe place. I've seen more anti-Semitism in New York, where there's many, many more Jews than there are in Hawaii. But I would say maybe in a joking way, because there's not enough Jews here for people to even know about Jews or to blame them. So therefore, we do have very good feedback. I've yet to have any negative encounter because I'm Jewish. And on the contrary, I strongly believe Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, the chief former chief rabbi of the UK, Allah Vashalom, who just passed away during COVID, he would say that non-Jews respect Jews who respect Judaism. That when someone has self-respect, the fact that they're Jewish, they're not hiding it, they're walking openly about it, people respect that because they look up to you. It's not about what you're representing. It's the fact that they see how proud you are with your culture, that that itself gives them a respect. They say, wow, I'm impressed that this person has certain values that they stand by, things that are important for them. I try to walk around as Jewish as I can when I'm here. I never try to hide it. And on the contrary, the more Jewish I walk around, the more people come over to me and either will tell me they're Jewish or they have a friend that's Jewish or just Shalom, they'll say. And I only get good positive feedback over here. So I'm definitely grateful for that. We don't feel any way uh, endangered over here or, or, or scared. Incredible. What an incredible way to put it. Baruch Hashem. It's a good place to go. I mean, uh, Levi, everything that you said, um, I think from all the places we've zoomed around to, I think Hawaii is uh, the big islands on top of our list. If we were to come, is there a place for us? You said there's a lot of place, right? A lot of place for us to just to come visit, yeah. to have any connections with any hotels. Is there something that we can count on? Yeah, we actually, there's communities that come and make like Shabbatons here. We have a community coming from Denver a young Jewish professional community. They say whoever wants to come to Hawaii, they'll do it together. So it's definitely a spot people come. There's a lot of retreats here. People come also for business. They'll have conferences. There's not so much of an industry where people work here, but a lot of conferences will choose specifically Hawaii. So yeah, you're more than welcome. Anyone that wants to join Chabad of the Big Island, please let us know if you're coming around. We'd love to have you join us for Shabbat, for the Chag, whenever you make it here. Amazing, look at that. Everyone, you're just invited by the rabbi of the Big Island. You can't get better than that. Well, that's incredible. That's incredible. Okay, I'm going to move on, Levy, to the uh, questions on the chat, and then we'll, we'll open up the mics. But before I do that to the questions, just to take a moment, uh, again, for those that weren't with us at the beginning, tonight is our final Zooming Around the World uh, uh, part of the series. 
And uh, as I mentioned and shared a story before, I think it's exceptionally, uh, it's, it's an amazing thing that we're ending off in Hawaii of all places, as I mentioned earlier. But I do wanna say that next week, uh, we're not gonna have the conventional zooming around the world, but we will be having a much longer program uh, going throughout the whole afternoon from 12 till 9 p.m. Uh, we usually have the annual Torah vigil. Uh, we have it here in Chabad Zuchin Kedoshim. This year it's gonna be on Zoom and it's gonna be a wonderful experience. We're actually going to be zooming around Montreal. Trying, you're gonna get a zoom into uh, many of the different Chabad centers here in Montreal, some of the younger blood in Montreal and get to know them and hear from them also some shiurim, some uh, Torah lessons uh, about these times that we're in, mourning for the temples as we come closer to the uh, 9th of Av, which is in two Sundays, the big fast day where we mourn the destruction of the temple. So we're gonna learn a lot about the temples, the Beit HaMikdash. So make sure to look out for your emails to get more information about that uh, for this coming Sunday, please God. That will be a much longer schedule, kind of a zooming around Montreal kind of thing. So a little bit uh, of a evolved zooming around the world. Okay, so let's uh, move along to the questions here. Um, Leslie wants to know, do you have any relationship with the conservative and reform shul in Hawaii? Yeah, so in Hawaii, actually, people are very much mingling. So I would say a lot of the members will go between the synagogues and there's no problem with it on our end. We're happy for people to go where they please, when they want to. So things work along really well. We did some, they have a cemetery over here. So sometimes when they need to do the Tara, so the reform will reach out and we leave the Tara for them. So it's definitely, as we try to say, I heard this, in the name of their Chabad Rebbe, I haven't seen it from him, he said the labels are for clothing. And as Jews, we try not to label them. So as much as we people use it just for sake of simplicity to get across a message, but we try to say that every Jew is a Jew and God doesn't label this Jew as this or that. He labels the Jew as my son. A, a healthy parent will label their children as these are my children. He won't say this is my child that lives on State Street and this is my child that lives on Main Street. It's your children. So we're all God's children. And maybe people have different preferences of what color they like in their ice cream and what color they like uh, the rabbi's clothing to be. But besides for that, we try to look at everyone the way God does. And if we were struggling with that, that's usually not that person's fault. It's usually our fault. It's usually because we're not being as unjudgmental as we should be. Beautifully said, beautifully said. So that's interesting though, that you also have the, uh, you did have, uh, we missed it, you got cut off there, but you have certain uh, program, uh, programs, but certain religious uh, pro uh, processes that you do together, you mentioned with the reform uh, synagogue, that's a quite fascinating. Um, David wants to know which island has the mikvah? So from our story that happened was actually Honolulu. Honolulu is the city on the island of Oahu. Over there, that's the original Chabad of Hawaii that permanently came out, Rabbi Krasinyansky. He's the head shliach, or the first Chabad rabbi for the state of Hawaii. He's been here for 30 plus years. So they have a mikvah. And that's where um, they went to fly in order to get um, yeah, the island Incredible. of Hawaii. We, we know Rabbi Krasniansky's brother here, Rabbi Moshe Krasniansky here at Chabad of TMR of the town. That's his older brother, I believe, is in uh, Honolulu. Um, Okay, so Hadalulu's got the mikvah. Uh, Joel wants to know, did you have restrictions with the COVID-19? Uh, how is that in the big island? What's going on there? So actually, Hawaii was very strict. Uh, from this, all the states in the United States, we had, at one point, we were less than half, even per capita, because of course, the state of Hawaii has a lot less of a population, but less than half per capita than the second to best state. The reason for that is that Hawaii is really the only state that controls its borders because the only way to get into Hawaii is by plane. So therefore they know exactly who's coming in and they can make restrictions on how you can come in. So in the beginning, there was a mandated quarantine and then they had, if you get a test prior to coming and then an additional test after you landed on the big island, there was two tests in total, one 72 hours before you come and one when you landed. Uh, then you were able to avoid quarantine. So they were really careful and they were able to control their own comings and goings of everybody in the state. 
And therefore we had, thank God, very low uh, infectious rate compared to everywhere else in the union. Um, otherwise there were, like everywhere else in the beginning, we had restrictions on businesses here. Everything had to be closed. There was exceptions for religious services at some point, and then slowly they started lifting things. But within a short time, we were back up and running. Um, it depends on the business. Each one made their own guidelines in certain areas, but we were back up and running pretty quickly with COVID restrictions. We just moved to outdoors, which our tent worked, worked perfectly for that. We did our menorah lighting. We had our mayor come, which was uh, during the COVID restrictions. And of course he was the one that was dictating all the rules. Uh, so we officially, our policy was everybody was supposed to stay by their cars. So therefore it would be okay, but thank God even with COVID, we actually saw more people turning up locally than before COVID. I don't know if the reason is maybe because the other congregation wasn't operating in person, or maybe because more people felt they wanted community, they wanted some sense of growth, spirituality. So definitely COVID was something that hit Hawaii. The tourism was really shot for a long time. Uh, that was something really difficult for a lot of businesses but it really shot back really quickly now. So things are really booming. Like the car rental agencies were completely sold out during the July 4th weekend, because that's how a lot of people are coming here. Uh, speaking about COVID, I want to just give a little bit of a Jewish twist to it. Could be you've heard this before, but I think it's really powerful how I would say one of the challenges that we have today, even as adults, especially children, is seeing the value with what we do how important is it to god or to the world or to judaism in general what one isolated person does and covid showed us that however it got out it started with one person and because of that it affected the entire world one way or another can you imagine one person in china just coughing while he was drinking his coffee and eventually the whole world shuts down and it changed complete societies how much more so when we look in the bright side of doing a good act? The problem is that when we do the good acts, we don't see these small changes. But using an example, imagine um, Hitler, Yamach Shemai, had a teacher that was really loving and kind and taught him how to care for another person, how to value another person's life. And he would grow up just being a regular citizen that was nice to his friend, nice to his neighbor. We would never notice that there could have been a disaster of millions, not just Jews, but millions of people dying because some guy was a maniac and he didn't value other people's lives. We would never know because he was taught properly. He behaved the right way. And he went about his whole life just being a regular citizen. And the teacher would never know that he may have averted such a catastrophe or Holocaust for the entire world. So when we do even just one good act trust God when God says that the good is way better than the evil. And if something bad, like a virus or bad attitude, bad teachings, which they taught to their youth in Germany, can have such a ripple effect, how much more so for the good, that if one person does one thing nice, they were nice to their neighbor, nice to their child, you never know how much that will actually affect forever the entire world. <laughs> Incredible. Incredible. Thank you for sharing that, Levy. The, um, we're going to wrap up here with, uh, I'll just, uh, there's one question here about um, uh, how limited is the availability of kosher foods? Joyce is asking, and how is it obtained? So you talked about the ships. Uh, I guess the question is, uh, how often do the ships come in with the kosher food on board? So the, right, so ships come in like uh, twice a week. They have the shipments come in, but we can choose when we want to add it to the boats. Of course, you can get local food here, like you would be able to get in any hick town in the middle of US or Canada. So you go into a Walmart to Target, you could find some basic products, but they won't have any kosher meat, chicken, or the Chalav Yisrael products, Pas Yisrael products. So a larger variety of things we have to ship it. And then we make a shipment as we need. So in our garage, in our, we have six freezers in our garage where we store our stuff. We keep it all over there. As the shipment comes in, we fill it all up. And then as it goes through, when we see we're getting low, we start adding on, uh, we make a new shipment. Incredible. And uh, I guess the last, the last question from the list, 
from the uh, chat. And then if anybody else else, else has any questions, you can uh, will unmute at, uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, what's the, I guess, before COVID or after COVID or during COVID, what's the regular, I guess, Shabbat, you know, if we're planning to come for a Shabbaton, what would be the regular Shabbat experience there that you have just from your community? Is there like a regular minyan? Do you have uh, services uh, every every week or is it just once a month? How does that, how do you have that in your tent? So we actually do services and a meal. We do the services in the same place as the meal. So unlike my other synagogues where everybody comes for service and then the meal, some people have, some people don't. We realized that that was something lacking in Hawaii for people to have a feeling of family. So we started from when we came here that right after the meal, right after the service in the same place, we have a meal and everyone's welcome to join. You don't need to get like a special limitation. And it really brings a feeling of family for the locals because most people that are living here are isolated. They came by themselves, not as a larger family. And especially with the tourists because Basically every week we have tourists somewhere in between, you could have as little as two or as many as 20. Uh, besides for the holidays, of course, we could get more, but we have always tourists joining and it's really nice that Jews get together. And like we spoke about before, no one asks who are the other people in the synagogue before they come. Everybody just comes and they feel welcome just because they're Jewish. They say, I don't know anybody, but I feel comfortable to reach out and join a meal with total strangers. The only thing they have in common is that we're all Jewish. So it's really something that we appreciate. The local community really likes every week to get new visitors. We go around the table. We have everyone introduce themselves and share something. We say, share whatever is on your mind that's insightful, meaningful, a nice experience, a nice story of something that happened. So it's a really nice, easygoing, relaxed Shabbat dinner. Um, and we do it every week, Shabbat dinner and then Shabbat lunch as well. Beautiful. That's a great, that's a great idea. We should do that here too. <laughs> All right, Levy, I'm going to open up the mics for those that would like to ask you questions on the mic. But before I do so, uh, something which I've had many requests, uh, and it looks like you have the most uh, availability to do so. Can you just flip your camera and show us a little bit of the outdoors of Hawaii? Uh, we don't want to lose you because I understand your Wi-Fi. Yeah, so, is... th right. This is connected over here. I guess you can see a little bit, but... It's not much that could be seen over there. <laughs> just just to show us the sky. That is something. <laughs> People like to see the world. That's you know. That's yeah. <laughs> if 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 you can if it's if it's comfortable, only if it's a yeah. All right. It doesn't move around much. All right. Okay. We'll keep it at that. But we get to, what we're looking outside is is the. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely recommend that you should Google pictures of the Big Island, Hawaii. We'll get the <laughs> professional shots. For better shots. Okay, that's a good, at least you referenced us. All right, perfect. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so again, before we open up the mics, uh, next week, please God, uh, we are going to be having a full day or full uh, 12 p.m. till 9 p.m. of uh, learning and of meeting and uh, greeting and meeting and learning with the uh, with different Chabad centers around Montreal. Uh, and uh, please God will uh, host that as well. Um, if all is well. And uh, that's going to be next week. So look out on your emails and on our e on our general email for the uh, for the event coming up next week Sunday. It's going to be a little bit different, but a continuation of sorts. But tonight was the end, the last, the finale of our regular zoomings around the world. And uh, with that, we got our twenty second invitation. I got your stamp on the uh, on your passport now. The rabbi of the Big Island has invited you, and there's plenty of room for all of us to be there and a meal to boot. So that's amazing. I'm going to, uh, Levy, this was an incredible journey. I want to thank you. And I'm going to open up the mics. I'm just going to mute you for a second, just to allow participants to unmute themselves. There you go. I'm going to unmute you, Levy. And uh, Leia here is with a question. Go ahead, Lily. Hi. I have many questions. I was in Oahu and there was no kosher. I lost 10 pounds. It was the best vacation ever. Anyway, <laughs> but, but uh, how close are you to Oahu and Kauai? Um, and do you ever get together with the Jews in those neighborhoods too, to make a big Hanukkah party or something? Yeah. So even though we're all part of the same state, it's not super convenient because the only form of transportation between the islands is flights. So Oahu is a 45 minute flight away from us. Kauai with a K. It's actually spelled also differently than Hawaii, but it starts with a K as well. That's about an hour flight from us. So they are slightly spread out. We got together 
and we had once a wedding from the Chabad rabbi in Honolulu. He was marrying off his daughter, so all the Chabad rabbis came in together. We had once a meeting with the governor in honor of the Chabad rabbi's birthday, so they had a proclamation. So all the Chabad rabbis came together in Oahu then. But in general, it's a little difficult. I tell people it's a little bit like how often uh, do the people from Montreal go to New York? It's not like a, you just turn around the corner and you're uh, in another neighborhood. It's a flight away by us exclusively a flight. There's no option even to drive. You can't take a boat ride. You can't take a boat. No, at one point, actually, at one point they tried making a ferry between the islands, but it had a lot of pushback for different reasons, political and others. So there are no options of boats between the islands besides for cargo. Those are the only things that go between the islands by boat. Everybody else has to fly. And how many, how many religious Orthodox people or Jews do you have around you? Or are there any? Um, so it's a tough question. I would say on our island, um, like maybe there's another, we have another guy that's Shomer Shabbat on the island, like exclusively Shomer Shabbat, which is interesting also because everybody has different levels of their commitment to Shabbat. So you have definitely other people that are more committed than others, but there's not a lot of people like us. I'm the one and only. So uh, <laughs> yeah, no competition over here. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Leah, for asking those questions, getting that information out. Does anybody else have any questions you want to unmute and ask Rabbi Levy while he's still with us? All I right. Oh, yes, Leslie. I have a question. Rabbi, you were talking before about how calm, how everyone in Hawaii is very open. I would like to ask about the marriage between Jewish and non-Jewish people. Is it more, is it more, are there, is there more of that in Hawaii than the rest of the United States? Yes, interesting that you bring that up. Uh, it is actually, I guess we could say pretty harsh here, pretty bad. The intermarriage rate is above 95%. It's really difficult because there's not that many Jews. So even people that want to marry Jewish, you really have to choose, is it more important marrying Jewish or living in Hawaii? And a lot of people come here, they say they want to marry Jewish, but eventually you don't have a lot of choices. So it's definitely a challenge here. It's difficult. People that are married Jewish are usually the ones that came from the mainland, already married and they retired here. Uh, but it's it's really hard to find here homes of people that are both parents Jewish. It's it, what's actually surprising to me is um, we also do weddings here for visitors. People want destination weddings, and most of the callers that call, I started asking the first question: Are both parties Jewish? And they say no, and most of them are not even aware that it's an issue, which. Mm -hmm. I guess says a little bit about uh, our state of uh, Jewish education, where most of them say, but I've been to a wedding where there was a rabbi that married off a Jew and a non-Jew, and I didn't see any issue with that. And I say, perhaps maybe they were reform or something else. But I said, according to traditional Judaism, I, I tell them actually, if you want to save yourself money, if you're going to be doing this anyways, don't bother hiring a rabbi, because it's not like if the rabbi does it, then it's a valid Jewish marriage. God doesn't see this as a marriage. So if you're anyways going to do it, you might as well not have a rabbi there because you'll save yourself money. It's just um, doing a show and saying things, but it's not actually validating it in God's eyes. So there's no need. But it's surprising to me how people are shocked to hear that it's even an issue. It's not like people say, oh, I know it's a problem. They assume, oh, you know, I don't keep kosher um, or I don't uh, keep the second day of the Chag as much as the rabbi does. So maybe I don't marry Jewish, but it's you know just about the same thing and my kids will still be Jewish. Okay. Now, I, don't know if, I don't know if we have time, but there's a great joke about it. Rabbi, uh, do, we have a, do we have a minute? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. I'm... So they say there's a grandfather. No rush, right? You taught us there's no rush. <laughs> Laid back tonight. Relax. A, a, a grandfather comes to his grandson's Hebrew school, you'll, you'll cut me off in the middle if you already said this joke to your community. I don't want to repeat it. He comes joke to his number 62. <laughs> he comes to his grandson's Hebrew school and he says, no, how's it going in Hebrew school? The kid says, yeah, really good. We're learning a lot about Judaism. 
So the grandfather says, tell me, who broke the tablets? So he says, Zaidi, I have no idea who did it. I didn't do it. It wasn't me. So the grandfather is a little bit upset at this Jewish education. He comes to the teacher and he says, uh, Mr. Goldberg, are you the teacher of my son? He says, yes. He said, well, I want you to know, I asked my son who broke the tablets and he says it wasn't him. The teacher says, I'm really sorry, sir, but I know your grandson already for eight months. And if he said he didn't do it, he didn't do it. <laughs> so this grandfather is getting really upset. He comes to the principal and he says, Mr. Smith, are you the principal of this school? You should be ashamed of this school. I come to the teacher, I come to the student. They all say it wasn't me. And he says, believe the boy. What type of school is this? Are you not embarrassed to run a Hebrew school like this? So the principal turns to the grandfather and he says, I'm so sorry to hear of your negative experience. I am making sure to take care of this at once. And on behalf of the board, I am telling you, you just bring us a receipt for the new tablets and we will fully reimburse you. Very good. <laughs> So, I didn't use that yet. <laughs> it's really important for Jewish education to start when a child is really young. And when parents say sometimes, oh, my son doesn't want to do it. You ask yourself, if your child didn't want to go to regular school and he didn't want to go to school, he wanted to play on Nintendo the whole game, the whole day, or your child didn't want to wear clothing or he didn't want to eat healthy food. He just wanted to eat nosh the whole day. Would you say, well, I don't want to force my child. I want him to come with it out of love. I want it to be something that he appreciates, something that he's excited for. You would say, this is something that's important for me and there's no negotiations. Not only that, children sense what parents find important and they know which buttons to press. When a parent is adamant about something, the child will give up very quickly. When the child sees that the parent is wishy-washy and every day changes his opinion, if we could have sweets, we can't have sweets, he's asking the parent, the parent is asking the child to put up a fight about it. When it comes to Jewish education, if the parent sees it as something really important, their Jewish connection is really important, it'll automatically rub off on the child and the child won't even negotiate about it. But if the child sees that the parent himself is every day complaining how the service is too long and that the commandments are too annoying and it's too difficult and he's not happy about it, he doesn't feel special, then of course the child says, listen, if my parents are not happy doing this, why would I do something miserable? I don't have that guilt that they feel. I'll just do what's exciting and fun. So it's really important for the education to start with the parents themselves saying, am I doing this proudly? Am I happy about it? Am I interested? And then automatically my children will find it just as important as I do. Just, I think there's a great example that brings it out. When it comes to kosher, uh, a lot of parents, you see, they take their kids to the store and the kid cries, he wants this sweet. And if he cries enough and makes a big enough tantrum, some parents will give in. But if kosher is something exclusive in the home, then you just tell the kid it's not kosher. He'll cry as much as he wants in the beginning, but he knows the way you said, this is not kosher, that it's not even in a discussion. It's not negotiable. I will never buy it for you because it's not kosher. And he gives up very quickly. Depending on how important it is for you, that's the type of message you give over to your children. All right. Thank you for sharing that, Levy. David, go ahead. Rabbi, are you the moil of the community as well? <laughs> no, so unfortunately, it's, it's interesting because I, I thought about becoming a moil for that reason. There is no moil in Hawaii. The whole state of Hawaii doesn't have one. Uh, so they fly in. Yeah, so every time we have to fly in a mile, which is not easy, it's expensive. And also people in our community, when we get the mile to come in, when a bris is on Friday, you wouldn't be able to make it back to the mainland on time for Shabbos during the winter months. So they have to stay over for Shabbos as well, which makes it difficult because it's a three, uh, three hour time zone difference between us and California. And then during the winter months, they want to be able to make it back. So it is hard. It's a challenge that there is no mile in Hawaii, but it's doable. We fly in a mohel every time we need a bris. Uh, mohel is the, the, the one that does the circumcision. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Rachel. Rachel, uh, just one comment. I think a lot of mohels would will be willing to sacrifice themselves to go to Hawaii and spend, <laughs> you know, overnight for the, you know, for the sake of the cause they would sacrifice themselves for an extra day in Hawaii. 
Right. No, that, that is in theory true. But uh, to be honest, uh, Moha, by the time he comes in, does the bris, he has to head back to the airport. It's not like you're sponsoring a vacation with them and their family and they're getting paid uh, for all the brisson that they're missing on the mainland. So I actually called up some Moalim in New York and I had the Moha that did my first son's bris. I want him to come for my second son. And he said, I'd rather you find someone in California where it's halfway already there. So it is... It's a challenge and it's not like people are running to do it because of course it's a lot of time being spent flying back, back and forth and you don't get to spend time there. I, I think I read somewhere in Hawaiian history that there were Jewish men who married Hawaiian princesses. I seem to remember something like that. So there is some kind of connection. I vaguely remember that. I know it happened in other islands in... Um, I think Fiji and other places in Polynesia and Hawaii is poly, part of Polynesia. But I right. seem to remember that there were also, there is a Jewish Hawaiian connection, Jewish men from the 1700s, 1800s, really early on before the official history who did marry into Hawaiian royalty or married someone who was Hawaiian royalty. So right. you know, real Jewish American princesses and princesses. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I do remember hearing that, and that's why also what I mentioned before about one of their coins had a Star of David. So there definitely was some influence in the government from Jewish people, but I don't know for sure to any degree of what it was. Yeah. You make Hawaii sound so delicious to come visit. <laughs> oh. Yes. Yeah. They actually, studies show that the hap they made a study in the U.S. who are the happiest people and Hawaii was the number one. So at least according to this study, they, they narrowed it down. They said uh, for someone to be happy, they have to be religious. They have to be married. They have to make a certain amount of money and they have to live in Hawaii. And they found one person on the island of Oahu that fit the whole criteria. And the headline was the happiest guy in the world. Because based on the science, he had all the details that were necessary. <laughs> it's incredible. Do you know the guy? No, so Chabad of Oahu knows him, but I don't know. Personally. Oh, okay, okay. We'll have to do a Zoom with him. <laughs> Find out his secrets. All right. I think we're going to call it a night. This was an incredible journey, Levi. Thank you for finishing us off with an incredible stop in, uh, in the big island of Hawaii. And uh, the stories you shared with us, the lessons you taught us, I think was a great way to finish off this amazing uh, series. And I want to thank everybody. I received uh, already some feedback in the chat. Thank you so much to all those. And I really appreciate you all being here with us uh, on all our journeys. Levi, again, uh, this was an incredible stop. And uh, definitely we're going to pick up from here. Please, God, everybody, don't worry. We're not going to wait too far, too fast. Give ourselves a short break and uh, we'll be back with bigger and better, please God. So keep your eyes uh, peeled. Is that what they say? You know, look out, yeah. look out for the uh, inf all the information that will come out. Uh, Levi, Hatzlach Thank Good you. luck. Keep up the good work. Are they going Hawaii like this? this, this oh, really? Yes. Uh, shaka. Right. <laughs> what do you say? The shaka. Shaka. Look at that. Yeah. All right. Shaka and aloha. That's what, right? Yes, yes. All right. All Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Levy. Thanks for coming on. I know it was tough to be on, and uh, you made it. Thank you, thank you. you. Stuck through, thank and it was an incredible, you. incredible stop. Thank you, Levy. Thank you, thank you. Right. You're welcome. Thank you, welcome. thank you all. Okay, I'm fine. We'll see you soon, please, God. See you in Bye. Hawaii. We're coming. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Sorry? Bezrat Hashem. Bezrat Hashem. That's right. Bezrat Hashem. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Okay, Thank you, Mandy. Okay. It was a wonderful series. Yes, Great indeed. series. Well, I enjoyed it. Indeed.